Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Mia Mathias, and I'm a curatorial assistant at the Whitney Museum. This event is being live captioned. If you'd like to enable the captioning feature, please click on the transcript option in the bar below. Thank you to Carrie from Sign Nexus for the live captioning. I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you tonight from the ancestral lands of the Lenape peoples, past and present, otherwise known today as Manhattan. I'm thrilled to announce our program this evening, Dave McKenzie in conversation with Adrian Edwards, which is organized in conjunction with the exhibition at the Whitney, Dave McKenzie, The Story I Tell Myself, which will be on view through October 4th. The exhibition runs parallel to the Whitney Commission performance, Disturbing the View, which took place from May 1st through June 12th, 2021. The exhibition presents Dave's video works alongside pieces from, drawn from the Whitney's collection by artists who have informed the concepts, gestures, and sensibilities in his work, including Trisha Brown, Chris Burden, Felix Gonzalez Torres, Gordon Matta Clark, Bruce Nauman, and Popel. In Disturbing the View, Dave uses the museum's facade as a canvas in a choreographed disruption of its daily rhythms. Together, the exhibition and the performance commission spend 20 years of Dave's creative output and reflect key themes in his art, endurance, exhaustion, repetition, and humor. Illuminating the seriousness of play in art making, Dave engages with and questions ideas, images, and language using his printable tool, his own body. On that note, it is truly an honor to introduce our two panelists this evening. Adrian Edwards is the Engelspire Family Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Whitney Museum. Dave McKenzie was born in 1977 in Kingston, Jamaica, and lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Dave often investigates representations of the self in his conceptually driven performances, sculptures, and videos. We expect tonight's program to last until about 8 p.m. Lastly, we would like to thank our colleagues, Megan Hoyer, Andy Hawks, and Yi Yang Zhou for all of their work in putting together this program. Now I'll turn things over to Adrian and Dave. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you, Mia, um, for that really warm and wonderful introduction. I'd like to start with a reading. Mayoral candidate Eric Adams washed windows. It is down the list of any draft of accomplishments but he wants you to know this anyway. He also wants you to know that those windows were car windows and he washed them with a dirty rag for some spare change. He wants you to know this now because squeegee men are in the news again, having returned to media consciousness on some yet to be worked out schedule. Now, then, again, later. Maybe the sequence is Fibonacci's or maybe they just return when the city looks broken, though it always is broken, it now offends and presumably offends the wrong people. Or maybe I mean the right people. The candidates will tell you this too, but they will fill the remaining space by telling you that they have a plan to fix it. How they can have so much confidence, I will never know, but I am sure that by the end of their term, the next candidate will tell you how the previous candidate broke the broken thing. And the previous candidate, now incumbent, will tell you that they have made great strides and that a second term will make gains permanent. One hopes. Meanwhile, you have washed your car during a sunny afternoon and now it's raining. Permanently installed along the edge of Gansevoort Peninsula, there's a David Hammonds but I keep thinking about another work of his, a fly in a sugar bowl from 1990. A materials list would include black zipper pole and bowl of white sugar. Have I seen it? I'm not sure. Certainly lived it and felt it. So what I want you to know, that with squeegee in hand, I made windows dirty and that rainy days were the beautiful days. I want you to know that a woman asked me if I was the entertainment and thinking about it flashes me back to the meek child that I was, and maybe still am. For a brief time, the museum was both my bowl of sugar and a car that I threw myself up against. Not for change, but maybe two. I want you to know that the last time I listened to Fast Car, it lodged itself into my brain for weeks. But as I write this, I search Tracy Chapman lyrics nonetheless and she sings, 
So remember when we were driving, driving in your car, speed so fast, I felt like I was drunk. City lights lay out before us and it, and your arm felt nice wrapped around my shoulder. And I had a feeling that I belonged. I had a feeling I could be someone, be someone, be someone. Hi, Dave. Hi, Adrian. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, I'm trying to figure out how I can see you. I've got it now. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you, Mia, for the introduction. That was really terrific. Um, I thought we could structure our conversation in two parts. Um, I wanted to uh, go through my Dave McKenzie lexicon with you, as I like to call it. A um, sure. few keywords um, that I want to kind of go through alongside some of the work, both what you just did here in the performance of the Whitney, your commission, but also some earlier works too. Um, and then on the B side of our talk, I thought we could talk about um, how we approach the exhibition and specifically the pairings um, with the artist in our collection and how you might characterize uh, your interest in their work and relationship to the works that we decided to show them alongside. Um, so starting here um, with this incredible project. Next slide, please, Mia. Um, with this great, incredible project that you did, I remember that it, I w I'm curious if you might talk about how it originated, because this is my recollection is we had a meeting, it was shortly after I had arrived at the Whitney in the spring of 2018, and uh, we were having like lunch or coffee or something one day, and I came down and um, you were sitting in the lobby. And I remember, I thought I was just picking you up and we went into our restaurant at the time and we started, I said, so do you have a sense of what you might do here? And then you told me about this idea, which is what we just did here. Where did that come from, Dave? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, the work really started with just thinking about the architecture of the building. And I had made, um, I mean, I'd been to the Whitney many times just to see exhibitions. And um, so I was familiar with the building, but when you invited me um, for this commission, I started really thinking about um, my experience of just sort of standing there, being there, kind of listening and um, watching people enter the space and have relationships with the space. 
And I couldn't help but think about the architecture of the Whitney. And, um, and many museums, I think, not only have their interior um, spaces as places to kind of come and have aesthetic and intellectual experiences, but also many of these museums um, that are built today are also places that um, have many functions in terms of bringing in a public or an audience. And I thought about the Whitney, its site. Um, I thought about the High Line and its proximity to the Whitney or the Whitney's proximity to it. And I started thinking about these moments where I'd be in the museum and I would notice someone looking outside, right? That even though you go inside, you turn around and you look outside. And there was a moment in my thinking where I just sort of imagined a hand or maybe a body on the outside of the glass sort of interrupting, or as I ended up saying, disturbing that scene. And um, I flashed in my mind to a number of encounters I've had in the world where I have noticed that another person, another body, um, another human being, they might just based on their, um, their presence in the world, their kind of announcing of themselves, they, they jar me out of me. And I think we all have these moments um, and they're disturbing in a lot of ways, often because they say so much about us more than the person doing the disturbing. Um, and I thought about that kind of confrontation of just another body, another person, not giving, not, not giving you maybe what you want, um, but also their presence being, being in the way, their presence, their, maybe their labor, um, maybe you just having to recognize them as human, um, which is unfortunately more difficult than it should be. And all of these things played in my mind. And I think um, I sort of say that the work came about in the shower. Um, just as probably a lot of people, you know, you go to the shower to have thoughts. Um, so that's really where the work came from, thinking about the windows, soap in the shower. Um, yeah, and the confrontation with another, uh, their presence. Just for the record, Dave, how long did you sit there that day? How long had you been in the museum lobby by the time I got there? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I had been there a while. Um, yeah, you know, I think sometimes with both like invitations to, um, to think really, and um, just my way of often wanting to be like on time, I'm, I'm often really early. And I think I think I'd been there quite a while just because I thought, okay, one, I can like sit and think. Um, so I don't remember how long, but but knowing me, probably much longer than I needed to be. I understood it to be hours. <laughs> probably not hours, but uh, it could have been an hour, certainly. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. So one of my words from the lexicon is um, repetition. And for me, repetition is somehow in your work very much related to circulation. Um, does that ring true? <laughs> um, it does ring true. Um, I guess I would say with repetition um, and circulation, maybe it has something to do with a kind of flow. Um, I was telling someone today, as I was describing the piece to someone, I was saying that on the fifth floor, um, the fifth floor was both like really difficult and really wonderful the first couple of weeks that I was performing. Okay, would you just tell everyone what the choreography was just really quickly before you yeah, the story, sure. where you started and came through? Yeah, so I always started on the ground floor and then usually I would enter the museum ha after having um, worked on some of the windows downstairs. And then I would ascend to the eighth floor and using the outdoor terrace spaces, um, I would go from like eight, seven, six, and five before uh, coming back downstairs to start the loop over again. 
Um, and the windows on the fifth floor were initially in our planning, not part of the performance um, at, at one point. And then they became available. And I was like, great. Uh, but one of the interesting things that happens is that um, those windows are actually already blocked. So I can't be seen from the inside. And um, that was a real challenge for me at points because I was sort of looking at a kind of empty space. But I, but I found in those moments and in this repetition of returning to this place or doing this kind of gesture over and over again, I was also incredibly free to have thoughts about my gestures and my actions. Um, and I didn't know in that moment how I was being seen, which is something that occurs to me often in my life. So repetition for me often is a, not only like a reinforcing um, strategy, but it's one that both is, um, I don't know if, if meditative is the right word. It's both meditative, I suppose, and also maddening. Um, and so it's a challenge to oneself to, I think, stay present or stay in one's body, to stay in one's mind. And I have found in that way that there is this really interesting path. You, you mentioned circulation, and I think of something flowing and that's both traveling around, but also occasionally being blocked. And um, for me, repetition is also a way to unblock something, uh, strangely enough. So, um, yes, yeah, circulation definitely rings true. And I would say maybe flow, whatever that might mean, along with that. Uh, next slide, please. So, truth be told, Dave and I have worked together a lot for almost a decade now on, on various projects. Um, and so when I came to the Whitney Museum in 2018, I really was like one of the first artists I knew that I wanted to work in, with in this context. And so this is an image from a piece we did together. Um, I curated for 154, the Contemporary African Art Fair that was at Pioneer Works. And I have, I'm, I'm showing these images, next slide please because I want you to talk about printmaking in relationship to this um, impulse around repetition in particular. Because sure. when I realized that you had studied printmaking, Dave, it really allowed me to understand the work in a radically different way. Um, so please. Yeah, um, printmaking is really, or had been really important to me. Uh, I went to school in Philadelphia, at the University of the Arts, where I studied printmaking. And um, I mean, one of the reasons I studied printmaking was because very early on, I figured out I wasn't going to be a very good painter and didn't feel like I would be uh, really able to figure it out. And printmaking was this department that there were, nobody was really in as a like major, like a student. And so I was really attracted to the, this, just the fact that there were very few people there and that it also seemed like this really interesting space of um, material and tools and this thing that later became really important to me of um, seriality you know, this kind of, this idea of a multiple that you could produce a number of things and they would be both the same and different. And um, this is also where for me, Felix Gonzalez Torres really came into my life because I think through Felix's work, I learned um, that you could, you could give this stuff away. <laughs> uh, I learned many other things, but that was like the initial thing that I learned that uh, uh, work and image and object could really spread throughout a space or throughout the world. Um, and so printmaking um, also for me, although it's not always, it took me a long time to get here, it's incredibly bodily in a way that I didn't know initially. Um, I would cite two people as just unbelievably important for me in that um, zone. 
there are probably many others that might occur to me as I speak. One uh, is Vito Acconci. Um, so when I was a student, I think about this a lot, um, like a lot of art students or students studying, um, you probably go to listen to a, a number of lectures at some point in your college life. And I remember very few of them, probably less to do with the speaker and just, you know, there's a lot of things going on when you're a student. Um, but I remember Vito Acconci and I knew a little bit about Akanchi through, you know, just being in the library, flip, flipping through books and catalogs and things. And Akanchi came and gave this like unbelievable lecture. And um, I, I realized later it was, a, I think, part of just him performing. Um, but he kind of did this incredible like stuttering thing. And I was like, what's, he, what's going on? I just didn't understand. Um, and there was just something about the way he was kind of controlling his voice and this rhythm. Um, and then later I thought about his trademarks piece where he both like bites himself and makes prints from that. And I always think about Akanchi because he said basically in this lecture, the thing that I really remember is he said that for, for himself, he knew he could be an artist because he knew he could think um, and that he didn't maybe have um, a certain set of skills, but it was okay because he could filter a practice through um, these other insights or other ways of um, thinking. And it had a, just a profound effect on me, one in terms of kind of like body, voice, um, looking for the things around you and being able to make a lot out of very little. Um, and so that for me was like when I really sort of became alive with printmaking actually weirdly. Um, and in this work, I made these sneakers that I could essentially make what I consider to be like an exploded typewriter. Um, so a very slow, laborious form of writing that was actually very painful um, and difficult to do as I would take shoes on and off, on and, off and, and write with the, the soles of them and ink. Um, the other person um, that I both mentioned in my um, intro reading and that I think kind of haunts the show, even though he's not technically in the show, um, is, is David Hammonds. And um, before I went to school at the University of the Arts, I was taking these Saturday classes. Uh, I took two of them. They were like kind of like portfolio preparation classes. And I took this one drawing class and it went well. I, you know, I always say said it went well. Like I honestly could never tell while I was in it. Um, and then I took this class that was kind of like a found object class. And I was really terrible at it at the time. Um, and because I was really terrible and kind of like super tight in my thinking about found objects and like making and putting things together, uh, one of the instructors wanted to show me this work by David Hammonds. And she got out a, a, a book that I think now must have been uh, Rousing the Rubble. I think it must have been from the PS1 show. And one of the images is David Hammonds, I assume in the studio, shirtless, pressing his body against paper. And I remember having a visceral reaction of get it away from me. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I love David Hammonds now, I, I should say, but I, I wanna state that very clearly. Um, but I was really sort of aghast of this person showing it to me. And I think it's all sort of caught up with, um, a black body on display in a way that I wasn't ready for in that moment in, in its picturing in that book. Um, but as I think back on that, I am unbelievably impressed by the body as not only a tool, but this incredible device to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so it, there's a lot of gap in between, but I think two figures that sort of bridge the gap of performance and printmaking for me um, weirdly would be Hammonds and Akanchi, even though, like I say, it's, it wasn't a straight line by any means. There's a lot to say about that. Let's go to the next slide, please. And the next slide. This is our images from a show that you did, um, group show curated by Andy Jew. Uh, that was at SF MoMA, I think the end of 2019 into 
yeah, early 2020, something like that. That sounds right. Yeah, and uh, called Soft Power. And I want to just keep going because I feel like this is where you can also see the relationship to printmaking, Dave, just to kind of round out the visuals around that here. Um, these banners that you were making, but I really want to go next slide, please, to the sculpture in relationship to, again, printmaking, just to, to pinpoint it. But unfortunately, we have a lot of ground to cover, so we'll keep going. But there's a lot to say about this work, and I encourage everyone to, to look up Anji's show that was at SF MoMA. Next slide, please. So my next word is risk-taking. Yeah. Um, these are, this is Bobble um, of 2000. Um, I want you to talk about, and you mentioned this a little bit when you were talking about the 154 um, bear piece, um, when you literally turned your body into this type writer or, or type printing machine. And I'm interested in this Thing that appears in the work around extremes. You performed the Whitney Commission um, for six weeks. I think it was six weeks. I think that's right. Um, and it was um, from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. when we closed. Uh, you took no breaks. I'm very curious about this proclivity you have towards risk-taking or exhaustion in the work or, or a, 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 a trying to find some limit if that's a way to describe it. Oof. Um, that's a really great prompt question. Um, I'm mean, trying to think. I mean, in some ways, oof. Mm, how do I talk about that? <laughs> how do I talk about that? You know, risk is really, um, not only subjective, but it is really personal often. Um, I'm working on a piece right now that I won't, I won't go into, but it doesn't, doesn't involve any obvious risk that I think anyone would see. And yet I think it's maybe like the riskiest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And it's really terrifying me. And I could sort of complete the piece really easily, I think. And I'm just not doing it because I'm I'm afraid of it, and I'm afraid of just the kind of uh, emotional emotional work that I have to do to make this work, even though um, it will look really minor when anyone sees it. So you know, when I think about risk and exhaustion, some of that is just also part of the way we move through the world, right? Like I. At least speaking for myself, I feel exhausted a lot. <laughs> um, I feel like this last year plus has been really exhausting. Um, doing the performance at the Whitney was actually incredibly um, invigorating. The last few weeks were difficult because my body hurt in a way that I thought I had solved. And that was really difficult to um, deal with and has been. But um, I also, when I think about risk, it's also difficult because the performances that I, had, you know, as a younger person admired were these much more extreme works. And I knew that I was never going to want to play in that space, right? Like I, I, I don't want to put or seemingly put my life on the line to do this work. Um, but I do want to put my whole self on the line with this work. And when I think about risk too, what is often at stake for me with that and even exhaustion is that these are the spaces and the moments where I think that I am allowed in some ways to have my real voice. And, and that's difficult to, um, to describe in a lot of ways because it's it's certainly not as if I'm walking through the world with um, someone else's voice but I but I very much think that um, in art making and in the kind of work that I'm making and interested in making I feel something that um, I want to label as like authentically me as difficult as authenticity is as a term 
but I feel most myself when I have a few of these moments. And so the risk in a lot of ways is how much am I willing to share of my like actual self in these works. Um, and even though it's not a simple kind of statement about who I am, um, I, I feel really exposed. Um, and I know I'm not alone as a, a maker of things in that feeling, um, but it used to be much worse for me in my like the aftermath of a performance or an exhibition that I, I would need to very much run away or like spend time alone. And then I just, I almost like, I, I found that after performing sometimes, I didn't want people to look at me, not because I was embarrassed of the way I looked then, but I was uh, slightly taken aback by the fact that I had let them in. Next slide, please. Um, Dave, I, I want to talk about also this thing around labor. Um, you, it's not like you ever, you spent some time with our incredible, wonderfully generous and open facility staff as part of the, the development of this work. Um, but your own labor, um, it's not like this is something I don't believe you haven't shared with me that you've done at any other point in your life. Um, I'm curious about this thing that you do where you put yourself in the position of not knowing. In the context of performance, we could think about it as what does it mean to occupy the position of being an amateur, right? The like counterpoint to um, virtuosity. Yeah. Is this related to um, finding a space for experimentation? Or is this about, and or is this about like trying to find a condition, a set of conditions for the imagination to do its thing? Like, what is it about this? occupying this position of amateur or trying to find that for yourself? Oof, um, your, your prompts are really I, excellent. I wanna to go to the next slide, yes. Because can I just say before you yeah. start, this piece which we did together at Third Streaming for Performa Biennial in 2013, I remember one of the things you said to me is, I have no idea how to tap dance. I'm gonna take one class. <laughs> And that's it. And but the piece is gonna, I'm gonna tap in the piece. So I just wanted to explain why this is here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for anyone listening, um, I would explain this piece more, but I just I I don't remember it. I mean, I remember it, but I don't remember it in the way that um I can talk about it uh clearly. But a lot of it is not only in the moment, but felt like I was um hallucinating. So um but it revolves largely around tap and um, I would say language on the subway um, and black people making snow angels. Um, so that'll just have to suffice, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, in terms of the experimentation, that goes back, I'll sort of try to connect a couple of things. It goes back a little bit to printmaking. So the department that I was in was really open and so I would do the assignments that were required of me, certainly. But I was really encouraged to mix um, materials and mediums or what? No, I wasn't discouraged from doing that, I should say. Um, so I could very much, you know, incorporate photography or sculpture. And there weren't many um, limits imposed on me. I think in a way, I also am really excited about not knowing certain things. I mean, I'm always trying to educate myself on a, you know, a process, a tool. Um, but I also, and this is maybe one more reason I didn't become a painter, 
I think there is this really beautiful space between um, amateurism and a kind of expertise, and they don't have to be opposites, and they can actually coexist. You know, so you, you, I want to kind of like move away from a kind of like total amateurism that um, discounts the history of a thing, but I also don't want to make things that are so kind of beautifully produced as to seem dead. And um, maybe also I want to bring Trisha Brown in really quickly. There's, um, I was listening to something, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the piece, unfortunately, but there's this really beautiful Trisha Brown work where the dancers are asked essentially to divide their body in half. And so they kind of do like, they count kind of, as I remember, sort of like one, two, three, four. And then the other side, it's like one, three, six, not, or whatever, right? And um, I realized just even in description, I, I, I don't understand. And beyond that, um, I'm like, I'm never going to be able to do that. Right. Or certainly not without years of training. And at this point, it's probably just, it's unlikely to happen. And I'm like, okay with that. Um, and not only am I okay with that, I'm interested in the like, well, what does it look like if I try to do it? And maybe it'll look awful and most likely it will look awful. But if I, if I don't proceed with this kind of, um, I don't know, general sense of myself as like wanting to activate these things, then I definitely will get nowhere, right? And so part of experimenting and being open and, and not knowing is that presumably I will produce something else in this like fractured, broken way. And that, I don't know if it's a if it's poetry, but it will be a language, and it can, um, if I'm lucky, still be something worth reading, contending with, um, analyzing, or even just looking at. And so I'm, yeah, I'm really interested at the moment in kind of my body and movement, and I'm like, I don't know how to do that, but you know, when I've when a really awesome song has come on and I've been in a place to dance, I'm also not a good dancer and it's never stopped me from dancing just like in those moments. So um, I, yeah, I shouldn't let it stop me here. And again, the, the great thing is I think something will happen. And then from there I can like, I can edit and I can analyze and I can like repractice. But the goal is not to get to a place where it seems like I've made something that is again, kind of beautiful or well-produced, but, but not breathing. Like I'm trying to think about what it means for artworks to breathe. Um, and I sometimes use the kind of analogy of you can make a thing and it's lively and eventually it will seem like it's, dot, it's dead. And sometimes you can resuscitate it and, and sometimes not. And knowing whether you can or can't is really important um, for me anyway. Next slide, please. So I'm going to keep going because there's so much to cover. But this is incredible when you're talking about like making objects and interested in the reality. There was a Dave doll. In fact, I have one here in my office, which I will just grab because it's here. And that Dave doll kind of also was in a parade in Aspen as part of a show you did there. So let's keep going, just so that people can see on the balloon. Great, next slide, please. Okay, my next word is, um, and you kind of actually said it a little bit in, in an earlier remark, is basic. Um, the minor. Um, the mundane, the everyday, but really about basic things. Next slide, please. And I'm really curious about um, how that figures in the work. Um, and But I want to go in a different direction with it, like an unexpected direction, which is really about 
the fluke was in the context of the mundane, the basic, the everyday. Um, you have this uh, openness to things in the work, like a, a profound belief that um, something is going to happen. And I don't, like with this project here at the Whitney, there were multiple times I found myself going, he had to know this would happen. Hmm. But I didn't know it would happen. And we can talk about maybe what some of those things are so that it seems like chance. But I actually have come to realize that it's more like you have this deep understanding of the social context in which you're working. And that I would argue that the work, actually this work in particular, doesn't seem to have much faith in humankind in it. I know that that's an extreme thing to say, but it was a devastating thing that I realized about this work. And it happened in watching people's reactions to who you were and what you were doing. People were either agitated that you were there or they looked straight through you. And I was jarred at um, the way it aroused discomfort and who it aroused discomfort in. And I was also really disturbed by the walking over, the bumping into, the complete moments of utter disregard. Um, do you have, are, are you interested in getting under people's skin, Dave? Um, are we, are, I mean, I'm just, I'm so serious because there's, in a lot of the videos, when I went back and looked at the documentation, there are punctums, which are like these moments of shocking awareness in, in these moments that um, is in this work, but also in a lot of the work, the kind of looking past and through, which seems um, impossible to separate from the bodies that you occupy and I occupy. So next slide, please. In, in relationship to the work, next slide, please. So, oh, go back to the next slide, sorry, Mia. So do you have a response to that? Um, yeah. Um, wow, that's such a, <laughs> this piece is definitely touches on that in a way that I'm not sure yet how to articulate. Um, I realized I learned so much doing this work. So um, just, uh, just wanted to say that. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the moment that I would, my body would really change or my role, both what I would say is like actually change based on how people saw me, how I understood myself, um, what was going on with the people who work at the Whitney and how I, I saw them and how I wanted to see them and how I wanted other people to see them and the labor that has happened always. Um, but in this moment also, in terms of you know safety and COVID protocols. Um, and there were definitely moments where I was, which is very unlike me, I, I hope, I wanna say this, because uh, I hope this is true about myself. Um, so I try to, I, I will try to live it. Uh, but there were moments where I really enjoyed actually getting under people's skin in a way that I don't think there's another work that I would say that there was a kind of enjoyment from my, um, from me in that way. Like I think actually in a lot of the performance works, there has been this tension that I don't think I, I created in the beginning in a like purposeful way of, of being invisible, like seemingly being hyper there and yet disappearing into not only the background, but into like the atmosphere. And I, do you think there was probably a little bit of me, especially on say maybe like the seventh floor where I would just, I would just find myself moving to be in someone's photo, right? And, and then moving again as they tried to like push me out of the frame. And I think in, in moments like that, I was both people. I feel like I've been there where you, you wanna flee others right? or you don't wanna deal with it. So you. I'll bury my head in my book or my phone. And 
um, I realized in moments that I also wanted to contend with um, not only the viewer, but also myself as a viewer. Like I, I do what everyone else does as well. And there were moments too where I felt defeated. Um, there was a moment where I was on the ground floor and I sort of was going along the windows and this woman kind of like moved the chair and I kept moving into her space. And then she basically just sort of like gave up, but she wasn't going to move anymore, you know, to allow me to do this. And I did have this kind of feeling in my head of like, you can sit anywhere, right? Like either I'm actually employed here at the museum doing something and you could allow me to do it, or I'm maybe making an artwork and you could allow me to do it, or I'm just some rando and you could allow me to do it because there's a lot of places for you to go. Um, and you couldn't even give me that. And, you know, I think then it's complicated by like, but I'm also not giving them what they want necessarily. Um, and then the piece also changes really quickly when I start at one o'clock and there are people who are sitting there waiting for me to perform. And I never like performing for them. And some of them are my friends who I love very much and I'm willing to do it. But I would often quickly run away from them. Um, and I was mo always really interested in the moments where the piece functioned closer to the way I had imagined it. What, which was very much like you're looking out of the window because your friend is gonna meet you and you have to wait in the lobby. And then there's this, this sort of splatter, it's the window and you don't know where you are anymore. And that definitely happened a couple of times. And I was the happiest in those spaces. Um, so it's more antagonistic than I would have thought it was going to be. Um, and is generally not something that I knowingly play with, but I, I couldn't stop myself either. Um. This is a great transition to my next word, which is withholding. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. So, um, yes, this sort of like I'm not here to entertain you, but yet I'm work. I'm making work for some performance. Um, would you talk about that as a sensibility, Dave? because I think it's something that I see across bodies of work. And to the extent that it's relevant, I, you know, this, this, I'm thinking about this piece in particular, um, Furtive Movements, which was shown as part of the assembly program that I did for the Freeze um, Art Fair here in New York in 2018, that was another one of these works that devastated me. Um, but I'm thinking about Lauren Berlant, a theorist who died really recently, mm. like in the last week or so, and this way she described Pothel's work of showing up to withhold. And I feel like that could actually describe a whole sensibility for a group of artists who have a certain um, visibility in the world and how they're working with their art to kind of put pressure on that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, withholding. Um, yeah, I, I think one thing that happened to me a couple of years ago is in these moments where I would get an invitation to perform, I was really worried about the viewer <laughs> um, and worried that the, about the viewer's expectations. And this isn't a like... Um, performance can be this or was this and is now this or could be that. Um, but I, I found that I, I wanted to strip away some of the things that um, might go into that kind of space of feeling like I should see a kind of thing that I will instantly be able to say that was worth my like cost of, you know, entry that was worth like these many minutes that was worth the fact that I skipped some other performance on the schedule to come see this instead. And I also think about like my body and the things that really jar me and make me think for days and sometimes years. 
and they're often really small, right? Like Vito Acconci stuttering, right? David Hammond's photo pressing himself up against like another surface and just like feeling as if I just, I don't know where I am, right? And why does this trouble me so much? And I need to get a hold of myself. Um, and within that too, sometimes the ideas come from a place where I realize that something really minor, as we talked about a while ago, is actually major. And it will take a lot of like unpacking or thinking about to, it would take a lot of that to prove it to someone else. And yet I'm convinced that it is, it is everything. Um, in this work, uh, this work started with um, ideas and language around stop and frisk. Um, and some of the ways that uh, officers describe stop and frisk, or like what would be a rationale for stopping someone and frisking them. And those reasons as described in a court case are incredibly minor. So the minor leads to the major, again, right? like a minor thing like, and this is literally in the, in the transcripts, like bending down to tie your shoe is the only thing that an officer trying to defend a policy that is clearly racist and destructive uses as justification, right? So the minor infraction of tying your shoe or sitting on a bench for too long or entering a lobby and exiting a lobby, all of those become a rationale for stopping and frisking someone. And I've never been stopped and frisked, but it doesn't take anyone of great intellect to understand the kind of damage that that kind of action might have on a person and a body and a community. And so I realized that in a certain context, and this is something I think about a lot when I'm like moving through the world and traveling or just going to work or being, that some of these things are just about context. And if I move through a different space, get off at a different subway stop, this gesture of me tying my shoe or walking or like adjusting my belt um, might be um, the difference between me feeling comfortable in the world and in my body and me feeling like I'm a target of forces that uh, in the moment might seem out of my control. And certainly in a piece like this, what I wanted to think about was that I had already been choreographed and I was trying, and many of us have been choreographed, right? Mm -hmm. And I was trying to like re-choreograph myself. And in this way of being an amateur and not knowing, the, chore the choreography can only look ridiculous and doesn't flow. Right, certainly it's full of repetition, but has no flow. I'm not a dancer. A dancer would do a wonderful job with this, uh, with this score that had been given to them. But for me, it looks something between normal life and me trying to heighten that. Um, and so I, yeah, I can't want in a way for anyone to feel like, oh, that was exciting. If anything, I want again for this context and these movements and my body, I want all of that to, to jumble together and be, be noise, right? Like I'm, I, you know, every, anytime you've invited me, I've, I've said yes, right? And I've enjoyed our conversations and working together. And, you know, like this context in particular was super weird. Really weird. And here I am performing a work that is a score based on stop and frisk in an art fair. And the kind of instant criticism or uh, questioning the work, even if it's not criticism, is why this space? And in part, I feel like, well, it happens everywhere. And to put it in this space is actually incredibly funny. And I'm really interested in that it's nothing in this place of, of value of, of making value. Um, and so it wouldn't have been like my first choice, but I don't even know like now what's my second choice anymore, having done it in this place that it doesn't belong, but was always there anyway. Probably the only empty 
um, kind of booth in the fair, which I kind of really loved because yeah. it had your name and the signage, but it was, you would go, you would do it. It was very fast how you would, next slide, please. Let's look at more of the images. But you would do this performance and then you would go and it would just be this empty booth, which was kind of fantastic. Next slide, please. Let's just, and there's, oh yes, the sign, which you would turn, right? Yeah. <laughs> not performing. Yeah. So simple, so straightforward, seemingly simple, I should say. Next slide, please. Okay, so, and next slide. This is my last word, um, and it is reliability. <laughs> There's some, some factor of trust or engendering trust um, in the work for me. Um, and across bodies of work. So next slide, please. Let's look at this, which I had in an exhibition I did when I was at the Walker Art Center. But this is a painting that you made. Could you talk about, it? does liability register with you at all in relationship to the work, Dave? Yeah. Program it? Um, in some works, definitely. Um, this one's actually really interesting in relationship to that because this work has an out. Um, so this is a painting that's actually a multiple and it, it is or does what the text says it should be doing. Um, and it has a backstory that I won't really get into, but um, it is in keeping with several works that I have made where there's a kind of contract either between me and a viewer, between me and a place, um, between me and an unknown person. And yeah, I definitely think about reliability. Um, I'll talk about another work related. Um, I made this small day planner that I- the image, Dave. Next oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. There it is. Um, but this relates very much to the proposal painting. Um, and I made this work at the Whitney uh, during a um, lecture that also had a component of a multiple. So I made them an addition of, I think, around 200. And in the year, as you got one of these day planners, if you came to the talk, I stamped in places that I'd be throughout the, the year. So I think there were maybe six or so dates, maybe six or seven dates. And much like our initial meeting, where I was waiting and kind of hanging out. When I would, uh, like this one, it says MoMA at this Jeff Wall exhibition in front of his photograph called Milk at 1 p.m. Um, I would find myself there at 12 or 12.30 waiting for a person that may or may not show up and that I wouldn't know who they were necessarily anyway. But I always found my body like rushing to get to that place to do the thing that I had said I was going to do, even though no one in the end would really be checking on me. Like if you had arrived at say 101, you would have just assumed you maybe you missed me, right? Um, and I think about reliability in this work um, and a couple of other works where I also have to be reliable to myself because especially with some of the performance works that I've done and some of the uh, kind of object-based interactions. I am also a viewer, even though I'm the maker, right? And when I talk about this work, um, one of the things that I always say is when I was like waiting for someone on a street corner, even though I knew that I had made this object and given it away at the Whitney, someone who was walking down the street not, you know, um, not dressed in the way that I might think someone who goes to the Whitney dresses or whatever, right? Or too young or too old. I stood there and turned my attention to them as if we were going to like be together. And it was really difficult, but I tried my best to level out the way I think about and see other people in the world. And I don't make any claims that I was successful, but I tried really hard in that moment. And so reliability, again, for me, becomes about me being um, present in myself and having something that I want to think is 
a better version of me um, because it's too hard to kind of be this, to be that person all the time. And so sometimes I have to try to make an object that allows me to have these kind of thoughts and interactions and relationships with people uh, because otherwise they may not have happened in the way that I would have wanted and need them to happen. Um, so yeah, I, I try to be reliable um, and I'm crushed when I am, am less than, than so. Wow. So just a time check, it's 8 p.m. And we just finished the keyword lexicon at the moment. <laughs> and so we won't have time to actually go through and talk about each of the pairings in the show like we had hoped to because this conversation has just been so, for me, robust and incredibly generous on your part, Dave, and insightful. And I've learned things that I didn't even know about the work. Um, so the prompts were incredibly helpful in that regard and your response is very meaningful. So I thank you for that. Um, thank you. Thank you for them. They were, they were super. Yeah, the good news is you, the object labels in the exhibition on the third floor of the Whitney, Dave McKenzie, the story I tell myself, uh, are actually in your own voice. You talk about the work and you talk about your relationship to the artist who the works are paired with. So anyone coming to the museum can actually still hear you um, or read or hear you actually explaining um, that. So we don't actually need to do it here. Um, that would have been just a bonus, a little icing on the cake, so to speak. Uh, but this is fantastic. I want to thank you, Dave, and really for the honor of working with you again. Um, it's always a pleasure. I want to thank our visitor services staff that had to field a lot of questions <laughs> from, from visitors <laughs> about uh, what was happening um, during your performance all those weeks. And I really want to thank again our facilities team for being extraordinary in what they did throughout this multi-year process. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Megan and Andy and everyone um, from public programs who helped make this a reality, uh, and Mia for working on the presentation and of course doing our welcome. So thanks to you all and thank you all for being here for the talk. Thanks, everyone.